Welcome back to Waste, folks, and we're going to be picking up where we left off. So we're going to start with the universal waste, and I want you to think in your mind what that word universal means to you. Is it Universal Studios? Is it means the universe in terms of planets, solar systems, and suns, and galaxies, nebulas? What does it mean? Well, in terms of waste, it has a very specific meaning. Let's get to it. Universal waste is first and foremost, drum roll please, it's a hazardous waste, but it's a unique hazardous waste. Here's why. It's generated universally, which means by everyone. So it's generated in businesses and domestic homes and sites, including the following. Lead acid batteries, like what you would find in a car, many lawn mowers, uh, big equipment, cathode ray tubes, which are known as CRTs, which are the things that illuminate electronics, pesticides, mercury containing switches and devices. For example, what you might flip open in your car to look at yourself in a mirror that lights up or when your trunk opens up and the light turns on, that's a mercury containing switch. And then only in Texas, paint and paint related waste. So these are things that everybody generates. They actually qualify as either listed and or characteristic. So they're hazardous, but because so much of it exists out in the world, we need a way for people to be able to handle these better and not be penalized for them um, and not be penalized for having them because everyone has them, right? So that's what universal waste laws are all about. Here are the benefits of claiming universal waste instead of hazardous waste. First of all, it does not count towards a hazardous waste generator status. That's huge. That means they're not paying income tax at the end of the year on that hazardous waste. Number two, it does not require that a hazardous waste manifest accompany the waste for disposal. Most will anyway, just simply because they don't want to have to be liable. They want to have that cradle to grave covered uh, because they need to, but it's not required. It is exempt from annual waste summary fees, as we mentioned, and they can accumulate it for a longer period of time if they're an SQG or an LQG. They have one year to accumulate universal waste. Now, I will put a caveat here. There is such a thing as a universal waste uh, large quantity handler, and if you fall in that situation in your business, you probably need to contact me um, or someone else as a consultant to help you, you know, do this process. I would just help you because I'm your teacher and charge anything, but I'm just letting you know that that stuff is out there and you need to be aware of it. So large quantity uh, handlers of universal waste have some registration and reporting and requirements they need to look after. So I want to go back to that Texas thing about universal waste, a paint and paint related waste. There's a reason why Texas has paint and paint related waste and it kind of boils down to the paint industry lobbying here in Texas to the Texas legislature to exempt those fees because they wanted to bring manufacturers like large manufacturers, for example, Toyota, and open up some big manufacturing companies in large cities like San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, and so forth. And the legislature agreed. So that took away some of their annual revenue from the annual waste summary that they get. And literally, folks, there were people in businesses who were large quantity generators the day this rule passed that actually became sea squigs overnight because their entire business was based out of paint and paint related waste in terms of what they generated for hazardous waste. So another type of waste that is generated in manufacturing is industrial waste. This is the stuff that's not hazardous, but it's the stuff that may need some handling. So at least in Texas, we identify them by class. And of course, you're going to need to know these classes for your test. So class one, class two, and class three are the three specific types of industrial waste. Most states will at least recognize class one because it's stuff that's almost hazardous, but not quite. And my example earlier about lead for toxicity, having a 4.9 milligrams per liter, 
would not be considered toxic, but wouldn't you agree that it may need some handling if you had some lead paint or contaminated soil with lead that had that kind of reading? So it's not hazardous yet, but it needs to be handled in a special way. So that's class one. I'll come back to class two in a minute, but let's look at class three. It's any inert and insoluble solid waste, such as brick, glass, dirt, specific plastics and rubber, which are not readily decomposable. And inert's the key word for your test. So what's class two? I am not making this up. Here's what the rules say. It's any non-hazardous waste, which is not class one or class three. Well, what's that, right? When general terms, it's what's called plant trash. Don't think of that as green growing things outside. Think of plant trash as the everyday stuff that's discarded in a manufacturing facility, like manufacturing plant. So it'd be like your to-go food scrap, uh, boxes and scraps and your your drinks that you buy at the convenience store, your styrofoam cups and your office paper and just regular trash. That's what plant trash is. So that's the most common and plant trash is class two. So for test purposes, just make sure you know the difference between a class one, a class two and a class three. These are non-hazardous, uh, so they don't count towards the generator status. The only way one would is if you have a class one waste that's not recycled. So uh, that would be something that's almost hazardous that hasn't been recycled, and then that would count towards your uh, annual waste summary. Another type of waste is municipal solid waste, and we'll have a whole lesson, lesson on this in the 1302 course, so we'll just briefly talk about it. What is MSW? Stands for municipal solid waste. This is a type of waste generated by a commercial and or residential source and can go to a type one landfill with a liner. That's what a type one landfill is. They have a very specific engineered liner that helps protect groundwater and the environment from leachate. Leachate is a fancy term for trash juice and you'll learn about that in the second course. So RICRA requires that municipal solid waste or MSW dumpsters be emptied a minimum of once a week or more if needed. So that's something that most places don't know. You could save your business some trouble if you work somewhere and they're not emptying out their dumpsters regularly. There is not a special environmental transporter license to move and transport MSW waste like there would be for the transporters that were moving hazardous waste. So anybody can get in the transportation of MSW waste. There's another type of waste, believe it or not, called special waste. And it's just that, it's special. There's something about it that makes it unique. Usually it's size and just the sheer nature of what it is. So by definition, what is special waste? This is any solid waste that meets the definition of solid waste that is unique because of its quantity, its concentration, some kind of physical, chemical characteristic it may possess, or biological property, something strange and unique about it. And because of that, it requires special handling and disposal at a landfill, including the following. Class one industrial waste would be a great example. So that's soil or lead-based paint that didn't quite uh, test out to be toxic, but it was at 4.9 instead of 5.0 milligrams per liter. Dead animals, you may be going, hee, that's funny. Well, let's think about it. You have your old red cow that dies out in the middle of the pasture, and better yet, you have three or four cows that die, and you need to get them to a landfill, because you really have to deed record if you bury more than 2,000 pounds of uh, regular MSW, and dead animals don't qualify as regular MSW. So you're really either supposed to take it to a rendering plant, and let's say you didn't notice for like three days that they were dead, so that, that option's out. So you have to get rid of these animals, so you would take them to a landfill. Um, you can do that. Untreated medical waste. Not all landfills that are type 1 landfills are permitted to take medical waste, so you have to know that in advance. Wastewater sludge is usually dried, and it comes in and uh, is put in as a solid into the waste uh, stream into the landfill. Grit and grease trap waste can go if it's approved by the type 1 facility. 
furniture and appliances, mattresses, diseased plants. These are all examples of special waste. So they have to be handled and reported in a special way by the landfill, and that's what makes them special waste. Another type of waste that's commonly generated that's not hazardous is medical waste. Now realize there could be a time where you have a medical waste that is hazardous. It meets the definition of either being listed and or characteristic. But most of the time, it meets the definition of being biohazard, something completely different. So the definition of medical waste, as outlined in RECRA subtitle J, states this. The medical waste is regulated by the rules in RECRA subtitle J and includes any non-hazardous waste that is generated in the diagnosis, treatment, immunization of humans and animals. So what does that look like? Any doctor's office, any hospital, any veterinarian, anything like that, a crematory, all of these places apply for medical waste. So landfills are required to have prior authorization before they can uh, accept medical waste and they'll find that authorization in their permit. They know if they can take medical waste or not. So red bag waste is all biohazard waste that falls under the umbrella of medical waste. So to be clear, if a landfill can accept medical waste, it is required to be disposed of in a special place within a special site of that landfill and documented where it is. And I think you can guess for obvious reason, just because of its sensitivity, right? Last part about medical waste is biohazard waste does not auto automatically mean it's hazardous by RECRA standards. And the reason is it has to be listed and or characteristic, right? And so if it doesn't meet, on one of the four lists, and or it's not toxic, reactive, ignitable, or corrosive, it is not a hazardous waste. So most of these do not qualify that way, but they do qualify as a biohazard medical waste that needs special handling. So now that you know about waste, I'd like to just review with you for a minute and start with the step one, which was identification. And step one means that you simply have to identify whether you have a hazardous or non-hazardous waste. If you determine even before then that you don't even have a waste, you're not regulated by RECRA. So once you determine you have a waste and you identify it's hazardous, that means you've either found it on the PFKRU list Remember P for potent, U for ugly, but potent only takes a small amount of the unused stuff to be really, really, really bad for you, like poisonous. And then F and K fall into spent instead of unused categories, and F is more common. So if it's on one of those four lists, and there's over 400 chemicals with those, or, and it's actually and or, if it's characteristic, and there's a trick for the characteristic, toxicity, reactive, ignitability and corrosivity. If you are a TRIC, one of the first uh, letters of any of those characteristics, then it automatically is hazardous too. And remember process knowledge is another way as well. So it could be that you have a listed and characteristic waste. Many solvents are both on the F list and they're characteristically hazardous for ignitability because their flash points less than 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So once you've identified you got a hazardous waste, you know what all you have on your site. So let's say you end up with four things on your site that need to be looked at every month. Step two is generator status. So you would go around your site and, and weigh those items, and you're looking to determine if you're an, a large quantity generator, a small quantity generator, or a conditionally exempt small quantity generator known as a C-squig. So LQGs can store as much as they want, but only for 90 days, and they can generate as much as they want, but they generate more than 2,200 pounds. An SQG, oh, by the way, for LQG's 90-day clock, right? For SQGs, or small quantity generators, they can generate between half a 55-gallon drum up to 2,200 uh, pounds of it, which is about five 55-gallon drums, but they can only store it for 180 days. Both SQGs and LQGs have uh, requirements for paperwork. Uh, large quantity generators also have some very stringent education for, uh, requirements for their employees. And they all have to, in those categories, get an EPA and state ID number for their hazardous waste to be shipped. The last group was the sea squigs and they have no time limit and they can only generate up to half a 55 gallon drum. But when they've got up to 2,200 pounds, which is about five 55-gallon drums, they're required to ship it off for proper disposal. 
So we've done steps one and two. We identified what was hazardous so we could actually determine an accurate generator status. The third part was accumulation, and, and that is important because you have to accumulate your stuff as waste management units, and then you need to make sure that your labeling is proper and that you have records of that and that you're storing your waste properly. And then we went into disposal. So disposal had to deal with when we had to get rid of it, and you have to use a uniform hazardous waste manifest. Remember the green copy goes with the generator, the yellow goes with the transporter, and the pink goes with the disposal and treatment or storage facility. And then the white is returned back to the generator within 45 days of the waste being picked up. Then we looked at industrial waste. You'll need to know class one, two, and three. We looked at universal waste and how it was different than your regular hazardous waste. And a special case there was paint and paint related waste in Texas. And we also examined uh, medical waste and looked at how each of those are different in special waste. So when you're kind of going through this for your test, it really makes sense. There's a sequence and an order that makes sense. And understand the story of waste is pretty easy to understand, and it was written in such a way to make it straightforward for businesses. So in conclusion, as we finish our lesson today on waste, some things cannot be overcome with determination and a positive attitude. This is lava and consuming a road probably in Hawaii. Not the happiest moment for that road. Happy for me as a geologist, right? Happy for you that you get to end the lecture right now on waste. But I just wanted to leave you with this thought. Improperly managed waste is not a good thing. And it is an obstacle that we have to come over and deal with in the environmental world. And that's why the standards are pretty clear. And the waste rules are easy to understand. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in our next lecture. Bye.